I don't know if I get up today. I don't know if I give one single today. My whole outlook is sunk in gray, and I have no idea why I woke up this way. Got my phone in my right hand, my books on the nightstand. If I unlock and I add pop, I'm stuck there. I'm a dead man. So Lord, give me this drink to please read one page. If it works in any way, I'll move on to the next thing. Oh dear, I got my socks on. I'm coming up. Welcome to Positively Undefeated. This is a podcast that talks about the day-to-day struggle ordinary people have over their demons and how each day they remain positively undefeated we share ideas and ways that you can empower yourself to remain strong so that you can embrace the journey of living okay welcome to our podcast on burl stricker this is um positively undefeated i want to uh thank you guys for tuning in uh if you haven't had a chance go to your favorite podcasting app and uh, like us, follow us, and review would be nice. All those things are helpful when it comes to uh, us being able to get our word, you know, the word out. I want to remind you guys about a couple of events going up. Number one is uh, we have our Midland Mixer. It's our introduction event in Midland, Texas. It's going to be on February 24th, so it's like two weeks away. So we're excited about that. That's at 6 p.m. It's at the Horseshoe Arena. In Midland, I'm sure you can Google that. You can also go to our website, which is evenonelist.com, and be able to find out more information. This is a free event where we're introducing our not-for-profit to the uh, Midland County in that area in West Texas. So we would love to have you. We're going to have music there. We're going to have uh, stories. Uh, we're going to have a, an auction there. So I think it'll be a great time. We would love to have you. Lots of good food and fellowship and so it'll be a great event um today i would like to welcome steve steve berry thank you so much for being on the podcast and i know you're a busy guy and we appreciate you being here steve if you don't mind for the people listening would you tell a little bit about yourself this so we can get to know you and um, i'll let you do that sure uh, steve berry and uh, i'm a certified alcohol drug counselor here in the state of oklahoma uh, i've got uh about 15 years of experience working as a counselor in substance use treatment through uh, various programs and different levels of care, outpatient, uh, inpatient, uh, long-term therapeutic community within the prison system. And so I've worked with thousands of of different people trying to seek recovery and some who maybe weren't interested, a few. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a little bit of pushback sometimes, but uh, I just love working with people uh what drives me to do the work is when you see the light come on in mm-hmm. someone's life and the behavior changes the attitude changes the spirit mm-hmm. changes and uh they can really grasp onto recovery and uh it really is miraculous anybody in recovery from depression from substance use disorder it really is a miracle mm-hmm. and, and in most cases it's a series of miracles that mm-hmm. has brought that about Absolutely. And so for for myself, uh, I have some lived experience with alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, I was a person who drank till I went into blackouts, Mm -hmm. and then I would drive. And there's not a whole lot more dangerous than that, you know. And by the grace of God, um, it never killed anybody or or myself and uh, never really gotten any— major legal problems thank thank the lord i don't know how that happened other than to say it's a miracle yeah, but yeah but i'm I'm just grateful for what i have in recovery and so i like to share that with people yeah well we appreciate it. me too i i mean i've been down that same road and i think that part of my story is that that you know i woke up one day and realized that that i was using alcohol to kind of numb you know all the things that were going on in my life and uh when I realized that, I, I always tell this story that maybe, you know, I'd had a couple of family members die at one, you know, my cousin had committed suicide during that time. My mom had passed away. And I, you know, I had like, let's say five or six issues going on, grieving being one of them, you know, depression, I'm sure one of them. And I kind of thought at the time that if I um, basically got a handle on those things, then I would you know, not drink as much is really what I believed. And I, in fact, I was, I was talking to a counselor at the time and really he kind of, that's his mentality too, is that if you, if you 
get a handle on your grieving and you get a handle on your depression, then you won't drink as much and that won't be a problem. But what I came to find out is I had to quit drinking in order to deal with those other issues. You know, I had to be sober minded in those things. And, uh, and that's made a big impact. You know, it's been almost two years since I drank and, you know, what a, what a great, what a, a huge difference that's made in my life. You know, it's just, I've realized through that process is that man, there's really no place in my life for drinking. You know, it just wasn't there because if, if it's not, you know, a major issue like, um, somebody dying or, or maybe, you know, back to the depression or, you know, something major happens, it's little things. And those little things can make me go do that too. And so, and I can use that as a coping me- method instead of, you know, the tools that, that I've kind of learned since then. It's, there's a lot better ways to cope than to drink. Absolutely. One of my, one of my, there's a lot of favorite passages from the big book of AA, but one of them says that we get a, a daily reprieve from, you know, that, that, uh, that urge to drink based on our spiritual condition. Yes. So if we keep our spiritual condition right, then, uh, we, we have fewer and fewer temptations. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, I hang on to that and I try to practice that daily. In fact, Saturday I had to, I had to go make an apology to somebody mm-hmm. because, uh, I had kind of popped off, you know, mm-hmm. it did, I wasn't the person I wanted to be. Right. And it ate at me all Friday night. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw him on Saturday, that's the first thing I did. I had to go, you know, try to make that right Mm -hmm. because I'm one of those people that that'll just eat on me. And and enough of those small things, like you said, Mm -hmm. enough, put put a few small rocks in your pockets. Maybe that's no big deal, but put one in there every day. Yeah. And about two weeks later, you can't hardly move. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. We just just drop those things and, and clear them up and put them aside and move on. That's what that reminds me. It's one of my favorite books, and the program is uh, called Drop the Rock. Yeah. And uh, I think that, that that book was so impactful to me because, you know, I could, going back to those, you know, five examples, it's like I'm carrying around five rocks, and, and I had to quit drinking because that was the biggest rock. But if I if I don't deal with those other things, too— then I then I'm going to sink, you know. So absolutely, I think that you know it is based on your, kind of your spiritual condition. I'm curious, like in your mind, because when we, sometimes when you say like your spiritual condition, it's based on that. People have all kinds of crazy ideas because maybe the way they were brought up with church, or you know, maybe they had a bad experience with that, and so they can't relate to that experience. And in, in your mind, what what does that mean for you? Well, for for me. I'm a I'm a, a born again believer in Christ, and mm-hmm. and so that's my personal experience. But I do recognize that that's not the path for everyone. Right. There, there are some who who just can't, like you said, their history or whatever they can't accept that. Um, and again, go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a chapter in there called "To the Agnostic," mm-hmm. which which talks to the non-believer about how do you find your path if you don't believe in God. But mm-hmm. this is this is a program based on a spiritual change. Mm-hmm. And there's some great stuff in there. Um, Narcotics Anonymous has some similar liter- things in their literature, too, that mm-hmm. talks about um, finding something greater than yourself. If that's the uh, collective wisdom of a group mm-hmm. that you could rely on, or if that's the uh, lived experience in recovery of a sponsor or a mentor or a person if you talk about spiritual uh, things, someone to disciple you, mm, you know yeah. how how to uh, how to uh, bring your your spiritual maturity along. But I think the biggest piece of that is the humility. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, you know, I I am not God, and I if I act like God, it's just it's futile. Mm. And so for me to try to control the world, for me to try to change the past, for me to try to uh, manipulate the present and future of others around me, it's futile. Mm-hmm. I just have to let go of those things and learn how to be content within myself. And that gives me a lot of freedom. Yeah. It's interesting because whenever the, when you first started talking about that, it reminded me that our progress and our growth is really, you know, it's dependent upon that, you know, as we talked about, about that spirit con- spiritual condition, but it's it's smaller in different ways than maybe I thought 
you know, originally, because it's like, if you recognize that you've offended somebody or you, that bothers you, that's growth right there. And sometimes we don't look at that as growth, but instead of us maybe going weeks with that same attitude of like, I'm real, you know, pissed off at this person or whatever, or I said something to them that offended them. Instead of us letting it go weeks or years or months, it's like we, it starts to eat on you real quick and you want to deal with it real quick. And that's something that's, it's part of the growth, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 uh, especially early on in recovery, I had to rely on others to point those things out because mm-hmm. I was unaware. I was completely yeah. self-centered yeah. And, and into myself. So I didn't realize when I had offended people or or stepped on toes. And so that was part of that growth, too. Mm-hmm. For sure. Well, I, I want to know, you know, I, I first of all, I want to tell you guys, you guys did a great job with your town hall, hall meeting. I uh, And we had a you guys, SWOTA had a town hall meeting here in Elk City, and it's so interesting to me how I even ended up there that, you know, Emily works with our not-for-profit, and she had mentioned it to me, and, you know, I, I was like, oh, well, you're going, I don't need to go kind of thing, and then I saw someone else that I knew, and they were looking for the place, you know, that opera house that they were trying to find it. I just happened to see them on the street, and they were trying to find it. I told them where it's at, and I thought— well, that's a pretty good indication that I need to go. So I ended up going and I was very, I was pleasantly surprised. First of all, there was a, a lar- large group there that I, I think that that was pretty inspirational to see how many people that were there. And of course, there were several people that I knew that I've had actually on the podcast, a, a, a few of them. Um, but to hear their stories up there and these guys are local got people. They're, they're people that, you know, a lot of people know in this community and to uh, hear their story again on, on that stage, that was something that I thought was very inspirational. I love the vulnerability and I love the fact that Swoda put that on and, and that it, it was uh, it, something that's very needed in this community. So I want to tell you that a great job with that. Thank you so much. That was a lot of hard work by uh, Deshauna Smythe. She's our local yeah. uh, coalition coordinator here in Beckham County, Beckham County, Oklahoma, out here on the West End. And um, she um, she really worked hard to make that successful. And we had a lot of, like you said, local folks who who talked about the impact of. Uh, substance use on their lives and and uh, how things spun out of control for them and mm-hmm. then how they found a path to recovery yeah. and and that's the thing is is uh uh you know gathering together uh people with like minds and our stories are not all the same our paths to recovery are not all the same but they're all valuable mm-hmm. and and i i agree i think it was very worth it and if you go to um uh, if you go on facebook and look for uh, Beckham County Drug Prevention Coalition. Uh, you'll find uh, the the broadcast of that town hall, and you can watch. Oh that. wow! So it's all, yeah. it's it's recorded. It was yeah. recorded. Yeah. yeah, she recorded that and put. I that think up if there. you did not, that's a great that's a great resource. If you did not get a chance to attend, or you don't live in this area, then I think going to that um, is that website. Is that right? Go to that website. It's a Facebook. Oh, okay. Page go to that for, for Beckham County Drug Prevention there Coalition. I think that's a, it'd be great to go back and listen to that. And, yeah. Uh, why do you think it seems to me that I, I know drugs have been around, alcohol, all that stuff, the, the substance abuse has been around. Why do you think it's so prevalent right now with the drugs? And is it uh, based on um, fentanyl or is it, is there something more? It just seems like there is an uptick in that substance abuse right now. Well, it's it's getting a lot of press because the fentanyl is so immediately lethal. Mm-hmm. You know, people people uh, just you know dropping dead within a couple minutes after taking the substance, yeah. and and that that I think has really awakened a, a lot of folks. Um, and unfortunately, we're back to the point where people who just experiment with drugs are really at risk of dying because mm-hmm. of the fentanyl crisis and and historically with with alcoholism if if you don't crash your vehicle 
it takes decades for it to kill you, mm-hmm. shut down your liver, your mm-hmm. kidneys or heart or whatever. Same thing with methamphetamine. Um, yeah, some people have a, a weakened system and methamphetamine will overload it and mm-hmm. blow out your heart or you'll have a stroke or something. But a lot of times that takes decades. And yeah. with fentanyl, unfortunately, it could be your first use. Yeah, wow. It, it is, it, and it's just so scary um, for people who you know, may not know that their children are buying, uh, you know, pills on, on TikTok or, or WhatsApp or, or some of the other social media things. And, you know, they think they're getting a Percocet or they think they're getting a Valium or a Xanax to help them relax. And in fact, it, it probably is laced with fentanyl mm. and it could be really deadly to them. And, you know, your, your kid who you think's, you know, doing pretty good, doesn't wake up the next morning, mm. you know, and it's just yeah. scary for those people who may not have heard of this or understand it is that, and I want to make sure I understand it correctly is that really the, these guys are using fentanyl and it, to really make it a drug cheaper. Is that really what it comes down to? It's like they're using fentanyl cause it's cheap yeah. and they're putting it, you're, they're mixing it with other uh, illegal drugs to make those cheaper and then, you know, we're buying it and, and we're not, we have no idea that it has this fentanyl in it. Uh, and then, you know, it's so easy to overdose on that fentanyl. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is much cheaper. Um, and, and one of the reasons it's much cheaper is because it is so concentrated that, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to make, you know, $100,000 in profit, you may have to bring in, you know, 200 pounds of heroin in mm-hmm. bricks. And that's a sizable amount, about the size of a hay bale. Let's yeah, say you have right. to transport that across the border right. or pay someone to do that uh, with the same uh, concentration of fentanyl. It may fit in a matchbook. Wow. You see, so so it's much easier to transport that and to smuggle that because you don't have to bring as big quantities. And then when you start cutting it out into individual doses, it goes much further. The, the other reason they use it, too, is because it, it is so intense, 50 to 100 times more potent than uh, morphine and heroin. Mm-hmm. You think about that morphine, you know, what they give you in the hospital, yeah. 50 to 100 times more potent than that. And so the the time frame from first use to regular use to problematic use to uh, a substance use disorder or opioid use disorder is much more shortened mm. because of that intensity. We saw that too with uh, methamphetamine, the, that that time from initial use to regular use to problematic use to um, stimulant use disorder was much compressed over cocaine and some of the others just because of the intensity of the high. Mm-hmm. Um, these are, you look at methamphetamine, you look at fentanyl, these are both fully synthetic. Mm-hmm. These are not created. They're alive. not plant-based, yeah. you know, and for, for most of human history, all the substances we used to get high were all plant-based and these mm-hmm. are made in a lab. And so mm-hmm. I think I, I'm not, I'm not the person doing the research, but I do think there's something significantly different because of that. Yeah, for sure. Our body doesn't know how to cope with it somehow. Mm-hmm. You know, because where our organization is very concerned is that we realize is that it takes usually it's some crisis that brings a point a person to the point of wanting to take their own life, you know, and and substance abuse is definitely one of those, because, you know, when you look at when we look at the history of people you know, committing suicide, it's usually the crisis is based on some kind of uh, addiction. It's based on drugs or alcohol. It's based on severe depression. It could be a loss, like a relationship loss. It could be divorce. It could be someone dying. Um, but it, it really has these common factors. But one of those common factors that is not talked about a lot, but I think it's important, is that if somebody is in severe pain, that that also, I think that you're dealing with two different problems. We heard stories of like people getting hurt at a young age maybe in sports, and then they take, you know, opioid that they were prescribed, and then this starts down this trail of addiction. And, but even if you don't have that trail of addiction, if you, if that person's in constant pain, then it also brings, of course, depression, not wanting to live, all those things. So I think that these things are 
are gravely important for us to understand, you know, because our goal is to get there before they even, you know, to help before they even get to that point of yeah. wanting to, you yeah. know, take their own life. Yeah. And, but it's, it's pretty prevalent when you listen to stories. It's like, even if you're talking about, you brought up the big book, it's like when you hear even the stories in the back of the big book, it's like, I can't tell you how many times people talk about they wanted to take their own life. Mm -hmm. Because of the, you know, where they were in this place of just really dark place. And uh, that's why I think that us partnering with organizations like SWOTA and us trying to find out how can we make a difference before it gets to that point, because addiction definitely plays a part. You know, and, and, and even like back to what you were saying is that when you're dealing with this fentanyl, it, it's like that addiction, that process from I took the first, you know, my first hit or whatever to the point of like, it's either, you know, it's severe or it, it's, it's life threatening is very, a lot shorter yeah. than some of the substance we dealt with in the past. Yeah. And that's, that's what really concerns me. Yeah. And I think that that's why we as a community uh, need to find a way to work on it together. Well, in, and, and you know, we talk about the precipitating events, um, you know, the, with the substance use disorder, it just <clears throat> it just baffled me that I couldn't drink like my friends mm -hmm. or I couldn't drink like family members. You know, it's just yeah. why, why am I different? And so I couldn't wrap my head around that. And yeah. so I spent a lot of time trying to make myself drink like other people. Mm -hmm. Didn't work, yeah. you know, cause, cause my body's just different. That's the thing. And so I had a lot of stigma. I had a lot of shame. I had mm -hmm. a lot of confusion because I didn't have autonomy over my own body. I mm -hmm. couldn't, I couldn't control my cravings. I couldn't control my thoughts sometimes. I wasn't, you know, yeah. I was spinning up and spinning out and that's a very desperate pro place to be for some people. And mm -hmm. so what I hope I, we can do through podcasts and things like this is decrease the stigma and say, you know, a lot of people go through this. A lot of people have dealt with the end of a career or the end of a marriage or mm -hmm. the death of a child or a death of a parent. You know, those things are sometimes naturally occurring parts of life. And there is hope out mm -hmm. there you know i think that's the greatest message is that there is hope that that you know where you're at today you're not locked into that the rest of your life you're not locked into that forever this is no. today things can change for the better if mm -hmm. if we put a little uh if we put a little investment in the bank to make tomorrow mm -hmm. better you know yeah that's such a great point and i think that's why that uh town hall meeting was so impactful yeah it's because you hear people that you I, the guys whose really lives have been changed and they're telling these stories in front of the judge you know the yeah. judge was there to talk <laughs> also but yeah. my point is is that that tells you the power of transformation because yeah. if you can sit up there and tell your story in front of the very judge who you know a lot of them you know got um, you know, basically, you know, sentence them or whatever, but they, yeah. they are in, they're a part of that. And, and I, what a powerful story to say that we can come out on the other side. And because I think a lot of times when you're in that dark place, you think of there, there's no way out. And that's yeah. to me what desperation is. When you think today is going to, tomorrow is going to look just like today. Well, that brings about desperation. It's and a dangerous place to be. If you're in a dark, dark place and you think in your mind that tomorrow is going to look exactly the same, well, then. There's not much, there's not much there. So you, you know, it, it's like whether you're talking about, I'm going to take more of a substance or I'm going to drink more to kind of go into this oblivion to say, you know, I don't even want to deal with life. But then when you wake up and here we go again, it's like this becomes this vicious cycle. And I think it's great to hear those stories and understand there is hope and there is a way out of this thing. Well, and, and uh, a definition of addiction that, that, that I like is is from a guy named Craig Nacken, and he wrote a book back in the nineties called Addictive Thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I would I would urge people to look that one up too because it helps explain um, substance use disorder greatly. But he gives a definition of addiction in there. It says addiction is a sick love and trust relationship with an object, which would be a substance or an event. 
So if that's the case of gambling or pornography mm-hmm. or some of the other uh, behavioral uh, compulsions and, and addictions. And so it's a sick relationship because it's all one-sided. I give everything and I only get a temporary mm. uh, return on that in the beginning. But later on, I don't even get a temporary return because with uh, methamphetamine, opioids, I'm just using to feel normal mm. in, the, in the later stages of it. So it's yeah. a really sick relationship. I give up my freedom, my health, my relationships, my career, uh, my good standing mm. in the community. I give up all these things for this substance and what's it give to me. Just the ability to somewhat feel normal. And then in the later stages, I don't even get that. Right. And, you know, so, so it, it's, they it call it a love relationship because, well, how do you know what I love? You could follow me around for 24 hours with a video camera and you could, you could see what I love because that's what I devote my time, my energy, mm-hmm. my attention and my resources to. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty telling. And mm-hmm. so if I'm devoting more time, energy, and attention to getting high or getting drunk than I am to my kids, mm-hmm. that's a value statement. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, it's disheartening to when you come to that realization that, oh, that's what I was doing. That's really disheartening. It makes you feel terrible about yourself. Mm-hmm. But it, like we said, that's not a permanent condition. Yeah. That is something that I could work on. That's such a great point because I think that goes with the part of the stigma is a lot of people believe they, you know, they got to this point, but to believe that they are worthless, that yeah. they, you know, yeah. and, and it just is, I'm not saying it's easy to get out of it. It's not at all, but there is an answer to get out of it. Yeah. And once you get out of it and you've been, the more you distance yourself, the more time that's there, you realize is that a lot of those things that you just kind of chalked off as unrepairable can become very repairable. You know what I mean? When you here, here's where you cannot repair it when you're dead. You yeah. can't repair those things, yeah. but you can repair those things as long as you are willing to get help. And willingness is such a big word in all this. If you're willing to get help and you're willing to go whatever, I'm always amazed by people who say, you know, there's tons of resources for people to get help. One of the resources here, right here in town, if you're dealing with some of the stuff, it might be Red Rock. Mm-hmm. And and so, but you'll, you'll hear there, they'll say something like, well, I don't want to go to Red Rock because I'm afraid that I might, you know, have to go somewhere and I'm afraid I might lose my job. And, and you, they start, they tell you all these reasons why they're afraid of but those things are going to happen if you don't. Sure. They're already happening. You don't realize it. So a lot of times you have to just put that in God's hands and you go seek that help. Mm-hmm. And once you seek that help, then you'll start to realize is that, okay, these things are repairable. Whereas they, in the, in the state of that being, you know, in that dark place, it's hard to realize that they are repairable. Yeah. But the stigma is to get help is still there. You know, we struggle with wanting to get help and and it's almost man we miss it it's easy to miss it because it, if we say oh we're afraid to lose our job or we're afraid what people might think but all the all those things are keeping you really from getting the help that you need well in and, and uh i would tell people too you are worth it you are worth the effort mm-hmm. um and i know a lot of folks who suffered trauma um, you know, who maybe had some really dysfunctional things they grew up with who get that idea in their head that they're not worth it and you are worth it. Um, mm. you're a child of God and, and, uh, you know, I, I think every life has value. And so I try to live my life that way that, that I, I do my best not to discount the needs of anyone who reaches out and, and try to, to treat everyone with respect and dignity and give them the same effort that I give everyone else. But Mm -hmm. you are worth it. And whether you believe it or not. And and so (laughs) we talk about willingness and, and there's some, some uh, language around recovery programs talk about fake it till you make it, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and so do positive things for yourself until you start to believe you're worth it. Yeah. You know, that's that's one thing I would encourage somebody to, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 
You may not feel like it, but go t- go walk for 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. You know? I love that, yeah. Just go go exercise for a little bit. See what happens, you know? Do that every day for a week. See what happens. Then you start to look forward to it. Because why? Because you really are worth it. You start to realize those things. Prayer, uh, meditation, going to recovery meetings, calling people, working with others has it. Yeah. Just it's invaluable to, to, to do that. Yeah, I uh, I think you're so right because we talk a lot about the fact that you know we we kind of break it down into like you have your spiritual and mental, and then you have your physical, and then you have kind of like I call it like more like your material, which would be like dreams and goals and things like that. And when we what we started to realize is that if you can hit any of those areas and you can just make one little change that it makes a huge impact. You mentioned yeah. walking, go walk for 15 minutes. Yeah. Being outside makes a huge difference. You know, yeah. walking and those things that you think do not make a difference make it make a huge difference. Mm-hmm. And I'll say this again, is that through this, you got to find a way to also find community, you know. And I think when you seek help, you those places really bring about a community. Yeah. And whether it's through a program like AA or a 12-step program through NA or Narcotics Anonymous. But I think that, you know, if you look at almost every single one of these situations, at some point, it seems that they have really isolated themselves. And it's because maybe guilt, it's maybe the shame of what's going on, but understanding that that's part of the willingness. You have to really break that cycle of like, I want to isolate myself. And really, if you can reach out to at least one person Mm -hmm. and seek help, you'll be surprised about the results. You know, and I'll bring another thing back to the, you know, the Judge Roper being there is that you, what I was in very much, that's the first time I'd met her really. And I was impressed by the fact of how much she wants to help. So you think even like the legal system, it's like her goal is not to just lock these people mm-hmm. away for the rest of their life. Her goal is to try to find impact her community and make a difference. And you could really see that through her talking and what she had to say. Yeah. And I think that that goes to the reach out and find some, at least one other person that you can be honest with and say, this is what's really going on. Yeah. I know that like, if you, it's like, if you're doing counseling and if you're not honest with your counselor about what really is going on, how much you're drinking or how much you're, you know, you're, that you're using maybe some illegal drugs, all those things, if you're not honest, then there, you can't find that help. But if you're honest and saying, this is what I'm really struggling with, then I think that you'll be surprised by the result of it because they, yeah, they might say this is what you need to do and getting outside your comfort zone. Those are steps to really make big differences. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and going back to that definition of addiction, you know, the, the pathological love and trust relationship. Okay. Finding a healthy love and trust relationship, find something healthy to trust, finding something healthy to love. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about uh, recovery currency or recovery collateral that people can build every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to bed about 1030 last night. That's recovery collateral so that today I've got enough energy and focus to do what I have to do. Yeah. Um, You know, talk to my dad. That's that's a relationship collateral so Mm -hmm. that that he and I know what's going on and I can feel connected. And so there are little things that you can do um, each day and, you know, it'll help with that spiritual reprieve Mm -hmm. from that uh, that uh, temptation tomorrow. You know, and so I I hope people would look at it like that is if I invest in something, it's going to build value. So if I invest in my physical health, it's going to build value. It's going to become more important or my relationships or my career or, uh, you know, getting over my legal problems. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's a huge uh, relapse risk for folks is when their when their fines come due. Yeah, you know, or or they have a a debt to someone who's sold them drugs that they have to pay off, and so these are all things. Chronic pain, of Mm -hmm. course, you know that's a challenge. But uh, I spoke with Doctor Blick down here at the pain management clinic here in Elk City. This is another guy. This is another resource in our community that wants to work with people. He wants to get a therapeutic regimen for you that works Mm -hmm. that 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 does the best that we can for your pain without. 
um, you know, just being over medicated. Yeah. And so there's a fine line there. He wants to maximize your functioning and he wants to you not to be in, in pain all the time. And so um, I, I really am impressed with him and the things that he and his uh, practice do for folks. Yeah. Now, now he'll make you he'll make you be compliant with the program. You know, mm-hmm. there's a few people I know who've been fired from him because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't couldn't stick to the program. Yeah. But uh, you know, that's not a that's not a license to give up. Yeah. You know, you gotta keep Well, going. I think that goes back to it's like you have to be honest with your physician on those circumstances. You know, I we have a physician on our board and we talked a lot about that. It's like we lie to our physician, you know, a lot of times we don't tell them how much we're drinking. We don't tell them really the truth about what we're doing, but understand it's like they are there to help and they sure can't help if they don't know the whole story. So a lot of times it's just be honest about the story about really what's going back to that, go, you know, about what's going on. And you'll be, I think you'll be surprised how much they can help if they have all the information. Yeah. Yep. yep. So how do people, Steve, if, I want to, you know, if they want to get help and they're seeking more information, tell them the best, some, some ways that they can maybe reach out to you guys or, you know, what's the best way to keep uh, getting in contact with okay. Well, we have some great uh, uh, local treatment providers in our area. We have Path to Miracles, yes. which is based out of Sayre. Yeah. And those folks do incredible work. So that's Sayre, Oklahoma. And they also have an office in Purcell. Mm-hmm. Um, but those guys do incredible work. We have uh, Red Rock Behavioral Health that you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier. And Red Rock does both mental health uh, treatment and also substance use treatment. Mm-hmm. And SWOTA, my organization, is partnered with them to do opioid-specific treatment. We have medication-assisted treatment on a mobile clinic. Mm-hmm. And then they have uh, that medication-assisted treatment here in Elk City at their office and then also in Weatherford at their office. Mm-hmm. And that's in our area. But but Red Rock has locations all over the state of Oklahoma. Um, but medication-assisted treatment, it uses an opioid agonist to sit on that receptor site in the brain so that my brain is fooled into thinking it got its dose so I'm not in withdrawal Mm -hmm. and I'm not having the obsessive thoughts about the next dose. Right. And so this allows people to uh, function uh, much more uh, beneficially early in treatment. Yeah. Uh, If if you choose an abstinence-only treatment, and abstinence only works for a lot of people. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything bad about it. And we need all types of forms and options for people. People should have options. Um, but, but abstinence based treatment, sometimes it takes a little bit longer before the brain clears yeah. and, and you get rid of the, that thinking, that obsessive thinking. And so our mobile clinic leaves Burns Flat on Tuesday mornings and it drives to Hobart in the morning on Tuesday and then Mangum in the afternoon on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, we go to Altus yeah. and we see clients. You can call Red Rock and ask for the mobile opioid treatment clinic and they'll put you in touch with somebody who does the screen. Swoda. Swoda role in that treatment program. We own the truck and we provide mm-hmm. the driver and we keep it clean and operational. Red Rock has all the clinical staff. Yeah. So it's their counselors, their docs, their mm-hmm. uh, case management folks who does that. I've been pretty um, impressed with Red Rock, honestly. It's like, I think that just like most people, maybe where you have this, you, this negative thought maybe about their services, just because you, you think that stigma back, back to what, you know, we, it's an error, honestly. You know, I thought an error. I didn't have enough information. But I, I, I can tell you right now, I've taken a couple of guys down there to Red Rock to seek help because they were looking for help. And they came to me and we went down there and they helped immediately. Yeah. And so yeah. Uh, my my view of Red Rock has really completely changed because what I see is that an organization that's not sitting, they're not sitting around worrying about payment, those type of things, they are willing to help. Even if they can't help, they can point you in the right direction. And I can name a handful of stories now where Red Rock absolutely stepped up. And I think that, you know, when you're dealing with mental health and when you're dealing with with some of the the uh, substance abuse and all these things, it's easy to look at a place that's trying to help and point out their negative. Sure. But man, there's so much positive. Sure. There. Um, uh, 
Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we love working with them. We have a great relationship with them, but they're, you know, we also have some other providers in our area. Um, if you go further southwest to Altus and Hollis down mm-hmm. in the far corner of the state, there's a, a place called Short Grass Behavioral Health. Okay. They have an opioid treatment program using the medication. They also have mental health treatment and some other uh, treatment for substance use disorders. I don't believe they have an inpatient program affiliated with them and neither does Red Rock, but they will find a bed for you if that's what you need and then yeah. bring you back home for that. Um, we have a partner in Clinton, which is George Hawkins Memorial Treatment Center. That's a Shine and Arapaho Tribes program over there. Not a lot of folks know about that. Oh, but if yeah. you're a tribal member and you need help for substance use disorder, they have an inpatient program. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Winnie Whitetail is the program manager over there. She does great work in, in her team. Uh, up north, if you're up toward Woodward, there's Northwest Center for Behavioral Health out of Woodward mm-hmm. that I would reach out to. Um, and so there, um, Clinton or um, Lawton Indian Health, uh, Jim Talaferro Center out of Lawton also does some treatment programming. So uh, there's some 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 great treatment providers that you know. Hopefully, the folks that are listening today, uh, you know, some somebody's in your neighborhood that you mm-hmm. can reach out to, and a good ethical treatment program, like you said, if they can't help you, if they don't have the best program to fit your needs, yeah. or you don't qualify. They're not just going to say, well, tough luck. They're going to find you a place to go. They're going to try to find the best possible situation for you. There is tons of resources as we've gone, you know, as as an organization, even one less, as we've gone down this road of trying to make a difference, we've realized we've been blown away by the number of people, resources that are out there. And I mean, I think that's one of our goals is to really let those resources be known. And, you know, a lot of things we're talking about, of course, are, you know, this professional help, but also there is a lot of lay people oh, absolutely. who are absolutely wanting to point, point people in the right direction. Warriors. Ear to, ear to listen to you. So, again, a lot of those at the uh, town hall meeting. I know the pastor of one of the Church of Christ here, he is— you know, he helps with like a 12 step program. We're trying to get him on the podcast, you know, because there are lay people who are absolutely doing a ton of work. I see some guys with, you know, with Alcoholics Anonymous doing a ton of work, yep. trying to be involved in the county jail, trying to be involved at, you know, in Pathways to Miracle, those type of things. The same thing with Narcotics Anonymous. They're partnering also with churches and, and so, those lay people, they might be your first contact. It's like you may be listening to this and like feeling still, you know, worried about maybe contacting somebody like Red Rock, but contact one of these guys and they will absolutely help you and point you in the right yeah. direction. So, yeah. and maybe you'll hear a story about how a place like Red Rock or others has helped them. Yeah. Because almost every one of them have some kind of story where some organization helped them. Absolutely. And so you have a testimony of somebody who actually has gone through the system and 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 they've got help and they were just willing to make that call or real, willing to show up. So um, if you need those, reach out and we'll be happy to give you some of those lay people. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick, quick Google search for uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous in my area. You know, you can find listings of where and when they they are. Uh, get your penny saver news. Yeah. You know, no, the, there's ads in there. In there. Yeah. Uh, Celebrate Recovery is another great one. Hope yeah. is Alive is another great mm-hmm. one. Um, we partner with Oxford Houses of Oklahoma that give folks after they leave treatment, if they need a sober living, maybe if they go back home, maybe a spouse, parent, Someone else in the home is still uh, in that cycle of addiction. But if they need a clean and sober place to live, um, Oxford Houses of Oklahoma, uh, the Oklahoma Association of Recovery Residents has a listing Mm. of certified places throughout the state. Uh, Amethyst House in Altus does some incredible work. Stacy Kirby and her crew, um, they they're working on getting a recovery community going in Altus. So yeah. it'll be a one-stop shop for people who need harm reduction supplies like Narcan or fentanyl test strips, people who just need a place to hang out, maybe do some laundry, maybe catch a 12-step meeting if they want more formal counseling or treatment mm. or even recovery residential stuff. They they want to be that one-stop shop for them. And so Stacy and her crew are working really hard to try to make that happen in yeah. Southwest Oklahoma. That's we love great. to see it. Yeah. Um, 
Well, the help's there. You, you know, I think yeah. that you just have to be willing to reach out and, um, and, and, and receive that help because yeah. there's lots of, you know, well, one thing I love about the whole recovery is, is that anybody who's been in recovery, they know they have to give it back. Yeah. And so what you'll see is a lot of people who are very willing to help because they know in order for them to stay sober and, and in order for them to stay clean, they have to help other people. And you see that spirit all throughout, yeah. you know, these organizations. So. Yeah. Just don't forget that you're worth it. You know, yes. you're worth the effort. You're worth the, the help and the hope and, and that investment to to try to give it a chance anyway, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it, just, just real quickly here to us, I, I really got to give a shout out to SWOTA. Yeah. Uh, SWOTA, it, it, it's the acronym is Southwestern Oklahoma Development Authority. Yeah. And so you read that name and you think, okay, they do economic development. But yes. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of other things too. We're, we're a council of government. So these eight counties in Southwest Oklahoma go together and they pool resources to do big projects. And so it's our cities, it's our counties, it's our conservation districts made up SWOTA. And we've done asbestos abatement. We help with uh, building uh, landfills. Mm -hmm. We drill freshwater wells. We do wastewater treatment grants. Uh, we do transportation planning. We have an aging services uh, case management folks. So if you have someone you're trying to keep at home rather than going into assisted living, mm -hmm. we have some resources for you. Uh, we do senior nutrition sites in Southwest Oklahoma. So it, it, in on top of that then is the economic development piece, yeah. you know, uh, rural firefighting certification, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you got a rural firefighter, they need to certify their equipment so that your insurance rates stay low. Yeah. So, so SWOTA has their fingers in a lot of things. And our executive director, Deborah, she was going to some national conferences. And this four or five years ago, she says, I keep hearing about this opioid crisis. Yeah. It started on the coast, you know, it was really killing people in Appalachia at that point. It was really horrible and, and creeping into southern Ohio. <clears throat> and she comes home and she says, what can we do here in western Oklahoma to prepare ourselves for what we know is coming mm -hmm. and to try to give people some resources? And so we developed these programs. We have the mobile clinic that's a partnership with Red Rock. We love that program. We have... um 14 different prevention grants from the Department of Mental Health for 13 different counties. Beckham County, we have two grants, one for marijuana misuse prevention and one for opioid uh, prevention. And we're spread out from Guyman in Texas County mm -hmm. to Medford in Grant County to Chickasha to, ha to Hollis in Harmon County. So we're all over West right. Oklahoma with that thing. Uh, we have a Bureau of Justice grant. Uh, that uh, allows us to purchase and distribute harm reduction items in five counties in southwest Oklahoma. And we're a Narcan hub for western Oklahoma. Mm. So uh, Red Rock Behavioral Health is a Narcan hub. So you can walk into any Red Rock and say, hey, look, I'd like to get some Narcan. They should be able to equip you with Narcan at no charge. Yeah. Same thing with SWOTA. If you can catch up with us or, or call me and say, I need some Narcan, some fentanyl test strips, we'll find a way to get them to you. Yeah. I've uh, worked with SWOTA, you know, throughout the years because of the healthcare and nursing homes. I know in yeah. the ombudsman program, That's also right. part of that. Yeah, I forgot that one, but yeah, yeah. it's really and important. So I have, uh, and I mean, there's what a great resource and just great people who work for SWOTA. So, yeah. and I mean, the whole, if you go back to what we're talking about, it's like, what's the point of SWOTA? To help. I mean, yeah. it's really there helping. Yeah. And it's helping a lot of different areas. And, and I think that those things, have made a huge difference, especially in Western Oklahoma. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for being on the show. And, uh, you know, again, I uh, I want to tell you how much we appreciate what you do. You know, us and, as an organization of even us, we do want to, if there's ways that we can help, please let us know. We want to be a part of this community and trying to make a difference is really what we want. Steve, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you. I appreciate it. And for you guys listening, thank you for listening. And, and like I said, subscribe and follow and uh, leave a review. Those things help us tremendously. And don't forget about our event coming up on uh, February 24th at 6 p.m. in Midland, Texas. Um, it's going to be a great event. Lots of fun. So hopefully you guys have a great week. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Positively Undefeated. 
there was something in this show that resonated with you, please share the show with your community. If you want the show delivered each Monday morning to your podcast app of choice, please subscribe or follow. And if you'd like to get a hold of Burl, please do so by going to burlstricker.com forward slash content. Thank you.